Hello and welcome to the sixth video in our iNav series. Now, so far in the series, we've talked a little bit about what iNav is, and then we've done two or three videos about how you install and set up things like the external compass and magnetometer, and then how you set it up and get it working on something like a multirotor. This time round, we're going to be installing iNav onto a fixed wing model. Now, in the previous video, we talked a little bit about the differences between the fixed wing model setup and the multi road setup, and there are a number of differences. And some of it at the moment is a little bit manual, but in iNav's version 1.6 and 1.7, it looks like the developers are putting a lot of effort into making sure that the majority of this stuff is taken care of automatically when you pick the kind of model that you want to fly. So in this video, what we're going to do is talk about how to physically connect all of the pieces on a plane to the flight controller. So by the end, we should be ready to go into the next video and start doing all of that software configuration and doing a couple of those manual bits and pieces to be ready to go out and start a test flight. Now this is the model that we will be trying to put the iNav stuff onto. It's one of our trusty old Texumos. We have a number of them here and it's one of our favourite wings. It's cheap as chips, it'll take loads of different kind of motors and they are pretty bulletproof. This one has been through the wars particularly. Underneath that tape on the leading edge there's all kinds of bits of hot glue and all kinds of stuff to put it back together but it'll be a perfect model to do our iNav testing. So initially we're going to try it out on a wing, but the process and the procedure is exactly the same if you're putting it on a wing or a more traditional aircraft. So let's cover a couple of things to think about when you're going to start mounting all the pieces on here, because on this model, as you can see, we have our servos installed, we have an ESC and a separate battery eliminator circuit to power everything. We'll talk about that in a minute and everything else is ready to install. So on here, we're gonna to have to put the flight controller, we're gonna to have to put the external GPS and compass, and we're also gonna to have to install the receiver too. But before we get into talking about those pieces, let's just talk about some of the things you need to be considering before you start getting out the double-sided tape and the Velcro. The first thing I recommend is that you install iNav onto the flight controller and make sure that it's happy. Now, a couple of reasons for doing that. One, before you start installing plugging everything in and start soldering things to it. I would recommend you always check a flight controller this way. If you try it and it doesn't work and there's a problem, then you'll have a chance of returning it to the vendor you bought it from. Uh, vendors don't tend to like to take things back that have uh, solder all over them and pins installed and other bits and pieces. Their view on that seems to be that you have broken it rather than it was supplied broken. So absolutely, first thing you do before you start soldering anything on or attaching anything, plug it into the computer, make sure you can flash it with iNav. Now the iNav flashing process is exactly the same as you'd use for clean flight, beta flight, and we've gone through it earlier in the series if you're not sure exactly how to do that. The other useful thing is, once you've got it set up, is to select the kind of model that you're interested in. Now we've selected a flying wing, and that also gives us a clue as to which outputs we're going to connect everything up to. Those numbers underneath the ESC and underneath the servos on the little diagram tell us exactly where we should be plugging everything into when we get to that point. Next thing to think about, of course, is where you're actually going to mount the flight controller. Be very aware of which is the front and which is the back of the flight controller. You can change that in the graphical user interface, but most flight controllers are designed to fit inside multi-rotors, so you might have to think about this a little bit. Now with us, we're going to mount the flight controller bang on top of the wing over the central gravity, which is one of the best places for it but in a larger model, you might have to put it inside the canopy. And in those cases, you need to think about, can you get to the USB port if you want to change anything after you've installed it? Can you also easily get to it to make sure that the, all the servo connectors are nicely pushed home? And last of all, is if you have a barometer on your flight controller, make sure it's covered by a bit of foam. Ideally, pop a little bit of foam underneath the case. Now, the flight controller that we're actually using here is this Omnibus F3 all-in-one version 1.1 and we have 3D designed a little case for ours here and we are going to put some open cell foam over the top of the barometer and the case will keep it in position. It does mean that the flight controller is a little exposed at the top but it's perfect for us to show you how everything's going to be installed and it's fine for this kind of test rig. Next thing to think about then is where you're going to mount your GPS and magnetometer. Now this is this little black round puck. We've looked at this already on the series. The connections are the same. 
on a plane, you don't necessarily need to have it stuck up on a stalk like we do in a multi-rotor. The reason that you do that on a multi-rotor is that you want that magnetometer and GPS as far as you can from all of the interference that you get on a multi-rotor with the large currents flying around, things like buzzers, all that stuff has potential to interfere with the magnetometer. On a plane, there are lots of other places we can put it. So long as the magnetometer's compass is a number of centimeters away from those key other key electronics, then it should be fine. We're gonna mount ours on the wing where we've got these little divots cut out from the APM installation that this wing used to have. So we're gonna pop it on there. We're gonna mount it flush with the wing. In fact, we might recess it very slightly to make sure that we don't destroy the aerodynamics on that part of the wing completely. On a plane, you can mount it pretty much where, wherever you want it to. Last little tip would be that if you are considering putting iNav onto a fixed wing model, it's great if you can go and have a fly of the model first of all and make sure that everything's happy. They give you a couple of things that will help you when we come to software setup in the next video. First of all, it will allow you to have a very good idea of what a cruise throttle feels like, i.e. where you need the throttle for the plane to be happy. And in that test flight, you can also use the trims to just get the plane flying as straight and level as you possibly can. And noting the position of all those control surfaces can be handy because that's ideally where we want the middle position of all the servos to end up when we set up iNav. So let's talk about how we're gonna plug all those things into the flight controller. First of all, let's talk about the GPS. Now we've talked about the GPS already. Now on the omnibus flight controller that we're using here, all the pins that we're interested in are actually presented on the same side of the board. So we are going to connect up the compass connections for the uh, SCL and the SDA lines onto the SCL and SDA pins, surprise, surprise. And we're gonna connect up the external GPS onto the ground plus five volts to transmit and receive. The only ones you have to be really careful of here is make sure which is ground and which is plus five volts. The other signal pins, if you get them the wrong way around, it's not a disaster, it just means that you have to swap them to get everything working. So that's a relatively easy thing to do. The next thing we need to think about here is how to install everything else. Now, we have got to install the radio receiver, ESC, and also the battery eliminator circuit. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment and then the couple of servos. Now here in the top right hand corner, we've got the diagram that was actually showing in iNav flight for how we're gonna connect everything up. And I've put a little bit of a note above each of the outputs on the flight controller that we're going to be using so we can see which is which. Now every flight controller is slightly different, so you do have to just watch to see which is your PWM outputs and which is your input for your radio receiver. But if you follow the process, it will work fine. First thing we need to think about here is that the plus five volts and the ground rails on these outputs are all connected together. So if you apply five volts to that middle pin, then all of the other middle pins will have five volts on them. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when we go through this, because occasionally new pilots get really confused with how the radio receiver is powered. And we will talk a little bit more about power as we go through these connections. So the first connection we're gonna make is to plug the radio receiver into those first three pins. On this flight controller, the same three pins are used for PPM or SBUS. So we're going to select that when we go into the graphical user interface. The next thing we need to do then is to install the servo connection. Now the servo connection again is pretty straightforward. If you look in the top right hand corner, you can see that we need to plug those servos into PWM3 and PWM4. So we are going to plug each of those servos in the corresponding positions into those PWM outputs and that's all taken care of. The last thing we need to plug in then is the ESC and the battery eliminate circuit. Now, as we talked about at the beginning, this TechSumo that we're using actually has an ESC and a separate battery eliminator circuit. And that might look a little bit confusing and there's gonna be questions about why we've done it that way. The reason is, is the ESC that we're using with the motor on this model has a linear battery eliminator circuit internally. The linear BEC isn't particularly highly rated and the linear BEC will generate a lot of additional heat in that ESC as it's trying to supply the current that's gonna power everything. 
Because you think about this, there's lots of stuff on this model that's going to be running 5 volts. Not only are we going to be running the servos at 5 volts to control the deflection of the control surfaces, it's also going to run the flight controller, it's going to be powering the stuff on the back of the flight controller, which is all of the on-screen display electronics, it's going to be powering the external GPS, the external magnetometer, and the radio receiver as well. So there's quite a bit of stuff here that's going to be pulling current. So what I've done is installed a switched battery illuminator circuit and 3 amps should be more than enough to handle all of those demands comfortably even if one of the servos starts to work a little bit hard in flight. Because what you don't want to happen is for one of the servos to start pulling too much current and to cause a brownout condition or pull the 5 volts down to the point where the flight controller starts to have a problem. Because if that happens then everything gets very exciting very quickly. So to connect the ESC and the BEC up, what I've done is I've disconnected the red wire from the three wire cable from the ESC. And if you're using an Opto ESC, it wouldn't have the red wire on anyway. We're going to plug that into the ESC connection on PWM1 and then PWM2, which is a spare connection at the moment. That's not used for anything, really. We're going to plug the BEC into those pins to power that middle line with plus five volts and connect to the ground pin on the outside as well. And that way, everything is connected and we are ready for the next video in the series. Last little thing I'll show you is how we're going to lay everything out. Here is a little overview of how it actually looks. We have the servos in the wings going into PWM3, PWM4. The GPS is probably going to be out on the wing rather than behind. It just made the graphic a little bit messy. We're going to have the radio receiver plugged into its own input and the ESC plugged into PWM1. Now we are going to have to make sure that our flight controller is actually mounted the way it appears in this diagram because that is the right way around. And if we mount it that way, then it actually gets a little bit easier potentially to put it all together. So join me in the next video where now we have all the physical connections together and basic iNav is on the device. We'll go through that list that we looked at in the last video to start setting everything up in anticipation of starting our first test flight. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.